morning, everybody. Oops. My name is Gabby Byrne, and um, I'm really excited, but also a little bit nervous of talking to you this morning about the benefits that people with lived experience can bring to treatment programs to further minimize the harm caused by problem gambling. But it's also my first webinar, so if you're watching and you have any feedback, please, at the end of the presentation, let me know what I could do better or what we could do better. And also, if you have questions, please, um, if you could hold on to them till the end um, of the presentation, so I will take the time then to answer them all. Now, a little bit of background. Firstly, you probably want to know a little bit about me and why am I claiming to be an expert of the lift experience. And instead of talking about it, I thought I'd show you a little video clip. So let's just start it. And it'll take a couple of seconds to load. And here we go. No? Well, as you can see, I was addicted to poker machine gambling. I lost a lot of money, many friends, almost my marriage, and I contemplated suicide on many occasions. It took me four years of trying to escape the emotional roller coaster through therapy, relapse, therapy, relapse, until finally I was able to kiss my love affair goodbye. I did a lot of things to stop gambling, and one that helped me the most at the end was I did a master's in neurolinguistic programming. It's probably a kind of a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, and it gave me some really hands on strategies to fight the urge to gamble. Once I stopped, I put all these strategies together. I published a book, as, um, I don't know if you can actually see it on the book, it sold over 10,000 copies. It was launched in 1996 and it was called the Free Yourself Program. I was teaching those strategies also one-on-one -on -one and to groups of people, and many of those stopped gambling or controlled gambling, but then they relapsed. And one of the common arguments was, Gabby, we have nowhere else to go. That's when I realized that the actual place, the actual venue was of much greater importance than we spoke. Now, once I realized this, I thought I have to do something about it. I can't beat the industry, but how about I join them? And I founded a non-for-profit called Chrysalis Inside Incorporated. In, and in 2001, we opened up a restaurant in the heart of the Shire of the Year Rangers called The Chapel. This was a 110-seater restaurant, and we ran this restaurant for four years. Now, it probably was one of the first social enterprises, and we only paid a chef. I didn't take a gamble on the food, but we worked this restaurant with up to 90 volunteers. They kept it running, you know, from, a, from helping out in the kitchen. Uh, I remember one lady, we had a, a big function and we had to um, chop up 15 kilos of carrots and she was sitting there chopping along and um, she said, Gabby, it's a little bit like playing the pompies, isn't it? You know, you do the same thing over and over again. Anyway, um, our focus was more on good food but also creating a community. So we had a, a regulars table where people could come and have lunch at 12 and dinner at seven. 
So they were sitting together, and instead of for many people eating alone at home, they had a subsidized meal, um, and for us a way of actually managing waste and, and um, creating um, some kind of vibrancy in the restaurant. We also had um, a regular band, we had live entertainment, we had um, we hosted trivia nights and lots of other things that brought the community into this. Now, half of the people that worked as volunteers were people that came referred to us from treatment services, gambling treatment services, or they came through my program. And the other half were people that were part of the community that just wanted to help out and uh, make this model work. So we called it our first third place. If you uh, look at, you know, third place is a brand that I think many of us are familiar with now. First place for all of us is home, second place for many, unfortunately, work. And the third place is a home away from home. Now, this term was branded by a sociologist called Ray Oldenborg, and he called a third place a place where people gather for the sheer pleasure of good company and lively conversations. When, sorry, go back. When I looked at the way the volunteers interacted and the results, I just had made a couple of observations. They weren't academically evaluated. They were just things that I noticed. The first one was that people who had issues with gambling and got actively involved helping us running the restaurant, they recovered quicker than those who didn't. The second observation was that shifting the focus from the problem because these people didn't talk about gambling that much. They, they were busy trying to work out, you know, who's taking what shift, what that need to be done in the kitchen. The focus shifted from the problem to, hey, what else can we do? What else is out there? And it is assisted their recovery. And the third observation I made was that there was an identity shift. All of a sudden, there weren't a problem gambler they became a volunteer and that increased their self-confidence and resilience. Now, after four years of running this restaurant, the owner decided that he wanted to sell and he didn't want a freehold. So all of a sudden, with all these learnings and all these people, we, we had no place. So I had to wait until about 2009 when the state government decided to um, award some money to all the gamblers' health services under what they call a um, innovations grant. And so I formed a partnership, Chrysalis, my organization, formed a partnership with Gamblers Help Eastern and the Victorian Local Government Association. And we developed a concept based on the observations that I had in the temple trying to prevent relapse by using leisure substitution, so something else to do, and peer support. So we, you'll find this probably quite confusing, but that's why I'm going through this. The first program was called Remaking Meaning, and it's, if you look at the cycle of change, I think most of you will be familiar with the cycle of change. This program really addressed the maintenance phase, not the action phase. So we mainly wanted people who have been through treatment, who have been through counseling and any other form um, of interventions, how do they maintain that behavior? How do they maintain the change? So the first program was called We Making Meaning and it's by the state government and it um, kicked off in 2009. After this first program, which went for one year, the evaluation, and we did a formal proper evaluation, found incredible significant changes and recommended that this could be a model that could be rolled out across the state. But then the state government changed and with that there was an idea about, or actually there was a commitment to establish a foundation which um, the Victorian Responsible Gaming Foundation needed about a couple of years to be 
officially set up and, and working. So there was no funding available for the rollout. So then, um, fortunately, the city of Moreland there, um, made funding available and wanted me to trial this, this model in a local government setting. So most of the things would be happening in the city of Moreland. Um, what you see up there is that the results of the first program that um, we, we actually published in the International Journal for Mental Health and Addiction under uh, the title Leisure Substitution and Problem Gambling. So if you're interested in getting the paper, um, at the end of this presentation, there will be my, um, my contact details so you can get in touch with me and I'm happy to pass it on to you. So More Connect 1 and More Connect 2 went over six months, same concept, which I'm explaining to you in a minute. And then the next, the next program was called Dare to Connect. Now, this was funded by the Victorian Responsible Gaming Foundation under the prevention scheme. And we ran six programs within uh, probably about 14 months. So obviously the time frame was a lot shorter. So those programs were only 12 weeks of duration. And um, all of those programs have been evaluated with the same scales and had the same significant results. So one thing that it showed to us was that the length of the program wasn't really that significant. Now, right now, we funded by a philanthropist and the program, we come full circle, if you look at my book, is called Free Yourself because in some ways the ownership of all the other programs um, you know, didn't belong to us because it was funded. So um, we thought we'd better uh, take a new name. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about, oops, backwards. Sorry, I'm technology here, so I have to go back. I clicked the wrong button, so we're much more further advanced than we should be. So I'm trying to get back to home here. Just bear with me. Uh, maybe I'll just click backwards. So ignore what you've seen on the screen now. We'll, we'll get there. I think. Get more. No. Lots of slides. <laughs> 44 to be exactly, but I should be able to just. Uh, sorry. Maybe I'll just use this thing. Yeah. Yes, there we go. We, we're very close now. I just put one back, I think. Okay. Yes, so what's the program? The, the program right now is eight weeks, so not very long at all. The commitment is for two months. It's a relapse prevention program, and it matches a group of people who clearly identify that their life's being out of balance because of gambling, it matches those with a group of volunteers. Now, because we've been running this program now since 2009, um, we have a lot of people that use their lived experience, not only as people experiencing problems with gambling, but also as volunteers of previous programs to stay involved. And with the support of those volunteers, we offer them a small sport of activities, uh, both social, entertaining, and educational. The aim really for us is to foster and create new neurological pathways to build a more solid foundation, which hopefully leads to a life beyond the dependence of gambling, but also uh, maintains the change that often in counseling is achieved. So i just show you a couple of pictures of these kind of things we do. Now, this is um, a very funny ice-breaking activity, which, um, you know, involves people having to dress each other up and um, their different groups and they, um, they work as a team and then, the, you know, the best team gets a prize. Um, but then we also do 
a lot of educational sessions where the main focus is really on fueling the desire to change, but also maintaining the change already there and understanding, you know, what is addiction? What is gambling addiction? How does it work? Why does it happen to me and not to other people? And um, very often we also provide them some practical advice about how to fight the urge, how to, um, you know, how to look for help. And also we give them access and refer them to other services if needed. Now, um, these are our prime educators. Now, Patricia Cameron Hill and Shane Yates, she is a nurse, she's a doctor, have been in the business of uh, helping people to cope with things in life um, that are stressful through laughter. Now, they have done an incredible job in researching a lot about brain, how the brain works, how, how actually addiction impacts on the brain, which areas, and they bring it to the people with, with fun and humor and a kind of lightheartedness that makes people engaged and, and, and want to learn more. That's one of the main focuses of these educational sessions. Now, um, we also address the body as a whole because um, I think it makes sense. When you feel better, when you fuel your body better with good food and nutrition, um, that you can talk to the beast better. So one of our sessions always involves to, to look at healthy food, healthy option, and we teach people some uh, recipes that are easy to make for one person as well as a family, uh, which is healthy. So that's another one. Now, one thing that happens during, during this program is that small groups form based on needs. So this group of ladies here wanted to learn um, water aerobics. One of the ladies in, in the blue swimsuit is a swimming teacher. So she took them, that, that was sort of out of our structured activities, uh, into a pool and we, they started with just the four of them having a, a session on water aerobics and one of them now is a regular attendant in the over 50s, um, you know, water aerobics in, in, in Coburg. So, so that's part of what happens automatically. The next thing too is that some people express something that they always wanted to learn. Now, these ladies um, never have ridden a bike before. So they expressed the desire to learn how to ride a bike. So we got in touch with um, Bicycle Victoria and got a teacher and they um, sealed out a car park and for um, eight Saturday mornings, these ladies learned how to ride a bike. It was actually um, a very successful session. One of them is now riding to work every day. So um, obviously has some health benefits as well. Now, since 2009, we had over 100 people who've been through our Relapse Prevention Program volunteering to support new participants. And what we found was that over the years, people, oh, what I observed to start off with, people that wanted to volunteer did this for different reasons. So I just thought, we had some money left over from our prevention program and I thought, how about we actually um, conduct a research study that explores the following questions. One would be, what are the factors that motivate some participants to volunteer for the programs whilst others choose not to? I thought that was a very important question because if we find the answer to this and we would run more peer support lived experience groups, it would be really interesting to know what is the motivation behind this. And the second question we had that we wanted to have answered in this study was, how does volunteering for this program impact on the individual's recovery from problem gambling? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it indifferent? Does it make a difference? So we conducted this study last year and the methodology was, it was an exploratory study. We, um, we recruited 14 volunteers from our cohort that 
um, we had over the years that were still involved. And we conducted semi-structured interviews. I hired an independent researcher to do this uh, because in some ways I thought it would have compromised the data if I would interview because people have a relationship to me. They've been through this with me for many years. So maybe they wouldn't have been as honest as they were with an independent researcher. And we used a non-prescriptive questionnaire. What that means was that we had questions that the researcher asked, but when if they went off track and things, we recorded this as well. We, we just tried to keep it as relaxing and casual. Um, all these interviews were audio recorded and then transcribed and analysed by the independent researcher and myself for emerging patterns and preliminary things. Now, we used also a, a software to analyse the data and the two overarching themes that were identified based on our question was, okay, where is the theme related to the motivation to volunteer and where is it related to the benefit to, re to their recovery, to the recovery of the volunteer that we interviewed. And the result of this was a motivation conceptual model, what that means, you probably can't read this very well, so I'm just, I think I'm just highlighting, now I'll go back. So if you look at the colour scheme there, the top row is probably very high up on the screen, um, all the focus and motivational themes are marked in yellow and the benefit specific themes are marked in red. I, I just want to focus on the main journey that most of the volunteers that um, came to us that we interviewed went on. And the first thing was that the focus and the reason they wanted to volunteer was that they still needed it for themselves. They really felt that they didn't want to leave the group. They didn't want to um, be you know, all of a sudden by themselves, they, they wanted to stay and volunteering for them using their experience was one way of staying in the group. As this quote, if you look at these quotes here um, from the volunteers that we recorded, you know, and initially it was to stay in the program as simple as that. I, I didn't want to really turn away from this. I wanted to still be part of it. The other one says, I do not think my recovery would have continued. I think I would have gone straight back. So to volunteer seems automatic. If not, I think I would have relapsed without it. So there's really a very strong focus on themselves. Why? These people really um, were ones that finished the program probably about um, a month ago or two months ago and then stayed on as volunteers. Now, then you'll find that there is a transition happening where all of a sudden, you know, uh, the volunteers learn more, the, um, it's reinforcing things, knowledge that they already have, and um, they shift from themselves. And, and here is probably a good quote that, that highlights, highlights that transition phase. It says, to, so to me, it was a way of staying connected with the group. And I guess it's to help yourself as well as helping others. So it's a double whammy, I guess. You're, not, you're still helping yourself. You still need that connection. But at the same time, you're still there helping other people. So that's kind of the dual thing where, you know, uh, yeah, I need it, but I also want to help. And the next thing is that, the shift in their social identity happens, where from a problem gambler, if we can call it that way, I don't like that sort of term, but from a person that identified with a behavior that obviously had a lot of negative consequences, all of a sudden they became somebody that's doing something good, Some, somebody that actually was um, uh, confident enough to help others. And if you look at the next quote here, um, this is the top one is my saying, you know, being a member of a volunteer group helps strengthen an identity associated with recovery and remove past association with addiction. The, 
the, the quote I'd chosen from our interviews was, I think, I see the turning point for me was becoming a volunteer, and then I started to become a giver. I feel most of my life I've been a taker. Now, this person, I had a gambling problem for over 50 years, so I think that's where, you know, there was a strong feeling of, wow, you know, now I can give something back because I've, you know, messed up a lot of people's life in the process of, um, of being addicted to gambling. Um, so... All of a sudden, at some stage, most of the people shift their focus completely from themselves to others, where they engage other people. They care more about the other person than themselves. They sit with somebody that maybe nobody is wrong to before because they might be... Um, have been socially isolated for long, they don't have any communication skills, but they take an active interest in them to help them to connect to others. And um, the quote I, I chose for this one is, um, they are, one thing I forgot to say is that they actually go beyond what the program asks them to do. I mean, this particular one actually called a lady um, because she just wanted to stay in touch and what she said there is, I don't want to forget about them. You know, this woman told her she was very happy that I rang. Something that I said made her feel better about herself and about things. And that's what gives you satisfaction, is knowing that you may be helped someone big time. So um, it's, a, it's a very clear journey that hopefully, eventually, through the development, skill development that um, we try to offer in our educational sessions, but also I think in our um, our social gatherings. You know, we we take people, for example, um, to live music concerts. Now that means that even though they're a group, they mix with other people. They enjoy probably. Uh, being part of something bigger, so we try to get them out of the out of the kind of group environment into one that um, enhances the learnings and 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 the skills that hopefully they learned in our um, in our course. So I'll just show you a couple of quotes here too. You know, this person here. Uh, his role at some stage, he, he wasn't confident enough to, to go and speak to other participants, but he was always happy to help setting up, cleaning up. So talking to new people, I'm just slowly becoming more at ease. I really struggled with that because it was out of my comfort zone. If I'm in my comfort zone, then I'm fine, but this was something totally new. So it has increased this program had increased his ability to talk to other people. And I think, you know, that's a, a great way of expressing what we, what we try to achieve. And I think what every program wants to achieve that uses lived experience to support um, new people. Now, often many of them um, refer to the listening skills. I probably learned to listen a lot more to what other people actually say or... Um, yeah, this person learned something about boundaries, you know, it makes me a better volunteer to know about boundaries. While this one says, well, I've got a whole heap of confidence and self-esteem back, the belief in myself, the ability to understand the skills that I already have, but they were also useful and could be applied not only here, but in other ways as well. And this, this person there um, took a, a really strong liking to... To, to use his body to um, make him feel better. So he walks everywhere, um, he goes to the gym, and that makes me feel great. And, you know, the consequence of that is that he's got that kind of high from something else, but he learned that this is important through the program. So um, there's also an, an element of re-examination of personal attributes. So what I mean with this is that people go back to the times before they gambled and, and remember what they were good at and what they could use now to um, contribute. She, he, 
she said, I've always found I'm good with one on one with people. It's about understanding myself that I'm now getting better at. Or um, I'm aware now of what makes me upset, my triggers, and I learned to stay focused. I really know now how to stay focused. And the final, I guess, the exit point for many of the volunteers or people with lived experience is the focus on the future. And that does not involve, for, for some of them, it doesn't involve staying in any kind of group environment because they learn to find out what they really wanted to do and they're strong enough to do it without group support. And if you look at these kind of uh, examples, I really wanted to learn French. I loved French when I was at school. So this lady went and, and did an um, you know, intensive French course. Um, I actually like to do public speaking. I'd like to be a spokesperson for an organization like this in some ways. And the last one actually went even further and he said, I'd like to go to Mooney Valley Council and I put my hand up and say, is there anything I can be useful for? Where am I contributing to society? Now you notice that that doesn't involve our program. It's just something outside that they discovered they're passionate about again. And I think that's a very uh, important part. Now, if you see the model there, you see that there's a um, sort of a line and a lot of these things are interconnected and often people jump between those stages, if you know what I mean. I mean, people have relapses. Let's face it, it's, it's kind of part of recovery. I think that, um, and you look at the cycle of change, um, that people sometimes relapse. And so then they will, you know, enter the program back at a different stage. But overall, we thought that this is a very important way of um, harvesting knowledge about um, how to utilize people with lived experience and their motivation. Now, I look at the conclusion that we came to and I just type it in here. The study that we did showed that the volunteer component in our relapse prevention program did support their ongoing recovery. That was a, a very clear um, result. We also noticed that the findings which we put together in this volunteer motivation conceptual model, that's a long word, but you know maybe somebody will come up with a shorter a uh, shorter word for this model, it could encourage the implementation of a volunteer component into other relapse prevention programs. I think it's, it's, it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm at a point now uh, where I, I've seen many people help by many different ways. There's no one way that helps everybody. I think the most important part is that you address the person's need and you offer them something to maintain change. If they're willing to change, if they're willing to, um, to go through treatment and interventions, there should be a program that helps them to maintain this change. What this program will look like, it doesn't really matter. But the people that have been through it should be using the knowledge that they have and should be able to use the knowledge that they have to help others because that's a natural instinct. It's a natural way of people um, that have been through anything. You, you know, you look at cancer survivors, you look at um, mental health system, there is always an important component of use, utilizing the knowledge and the actual um, heartfelt experience to help others. And so I think that um, a volunteer component or a lived experience component, whatever you want to call it, or peer support, should become integrated into uh, the services and, and it should be an option for people that want to engage with others and want to help others. Now, I also think that knowing what drives individuals to volunteer 
and how this changes over time if you um, you know look at the model that we have and you you incorporate this component into a program it could help you to facilitate the adequate support at each stage that the volunteers go through because if somebody's in the stage of Look, still looking after themselves, still still needing the, the support, but just because they have a label as a volunteer, um, you have to support them to reach to the next step. And so just telling them that they're there to engage others would probably turn them off. So I think looking at that model, um, I think that you could, Every, every program that is based on using peer support could learn something on how to support the people through the program to get them to a point where really they're, they're ready to start a new life beyond gambling. So I think I'm probably a bit faster than I thought. I probably talked a bit faster. Um, I, I hope that you got something of interest through this presentation. You see at the bottom there, there's two websites. Um, one is my Free Yourself website, the other one is the um, Chrysalis Insight website. And if you're interested in the volunteer report or as I said before, the evaluation report of, of the model that um, we explored, then um, I'm happy to mail them to you. Please feel free to contact me. And if anybody's listening who has a question, now is the time. Speak now or forever. <laughs> Would you be? Okay. Anybody out there? I don't know. I can't see. Uh, there are many people there. I just, I suppose, um, this is, um, for those listening, this is Debbie Hunt here. I'm the Clinical Project Officer at the Foundation. And um, just wanted to thank you, Gary, for your time and expertise. And this is, um, I think, Pretty amazing work. Um, it's a lot of time and experience has gone into it, and the things you've developed are fantastic. And perhaps specifically, you put a big, big emphasis on talking. Of, it's kind of about lived experience. Um, and I, I, from someone who's worked in lived experience um, kind of areas before, I think that's a, it is absolutely an important part, and it's something which isn't explored too much. Um, or no, the other sort of big. Um, uh, kind of organisations who do engage people with experience, I don't think do stop to think too much about okay, what is that person getting out of it, and what is the success for them, and that kind of nature of that kind of distinction between wanting to take part and needing to take part is important. And I think it's probably an issue which lots of people working in clinical fields are kind of interested in. And so, for me, your the presentation you've given and the the, the kind of the, the focuses you have really do speak to that. And but I realise this is a comment more on the question, but what you've sort of put across quite strongly is the, it's important to sort of let go of people. Some people yeah. um, not needing to do any more is success. Um, and it's against, I think, other common models like um, GA, where somehow it's kind of that, that and I don't get me wrong, I, I think it has a place. Sure. Uh, but I think what, what really programs should try to achieve is equip people with um, a life, life skills that, you know, help them to live a good life without gambling um, and, and reignite their desire to do other things. And yeah, I mean, again, for people listening, Gabby is involved in the together, and I, I, I hope that we're able to bring some of that emphasis to it. And I, I said, I do think it's absolutely crucial part of any experience. Uh, also, maybe add to evaluation as well, um, and consider. There is an opportunity for perhaps keeping contact with people who are um, involved as well, um, who maybe are big leads and following up a bit later down the track and sort of seeing and maybe looking about if people have maybe moved through those kind of phases you, you talk about, about kind of emphasis on self, to emphasis on others, and they've been able to a life in the future, whatever that may be. Um, so, once again, thank you very much. Um, I will open the case. There is anyone out there uh, who is interested in answer questions? Um,
Okay, we have Siobhan's asked, can you remind me who funded these programs? I'd love to check out the reports. Um, Gary, I'll let you fill that. Can I type or can I uh, I'll let you talk. Okay. Um, I'll, um, yeah. Yes, um, I, the, the programs that were properly evaluated where the first one was funded by the um, by the state government of the time, that was in 2009, and I'm happy to send you the report. Um, if you can email me, uh, if you go onto one of my websites and email me your details, I'll, I'll send you both of the reports. The, um, the, the last one that then resulted in the volunteer report, it was funded by the Victorian Responsible Gaming Foundation, or some of it. Um, we had some rest money and we got some other funding to, to um, did the report, but I'm very happy to send you send you the report. And thanks for, for listening. <laughs> well, I'm listening to all the other if you want to, I think we may be able to hear you if you want to speak, but otherwise I locked it out because there's a little bit of background noise. Okay, great. It's and sure I'm saying she will check in the check out of course. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that being all, we'll again, uh, I guess we'll wrap up. Thanks again, Gabby, for your time. Thank you. Thank you.